Great. So we're going to be recording this program. Uh, if you don't want to be recorded, then please don't say anything. Uh, Sarah just sent a message out that the uh, PowerPoint slides are up on our website. We put them up in PDF format so they're easy to download and for anyone to look at. You don't need to have that PowerPoint program to see them. Uh, the program will be up by the end of the week. I'm actually out of the office tomorrow going to visit our Hudson Valley Long-Term Care Amazon program. But by uh, Thursday or Friday at the latest, we will have the presentation, excuse me, the um, recording of this webinar up for people to listen to on our YouTube channel, channel which is accessible through nursinghome411.org. So without further ado, we're going to get started. Uh, I always start with a little bit of background about the my organization, Long-Term Care Community Coalition, as well as a background on the nursing home law and regulation. So if you've been with us before, please bear with me. But for anyone who's new, I just want to let you know that uh, we are the Long-Term Care Community Coalition. We are a nonprofit organization entirely dedicated to improving care and quality of life for elderly and adult disabled people in long-term care, in particular in nursing homes and assisted living and other residential care settings. Our work, and welcome everyone who's just coming in, we're just getting started. Uh, so we focus on policy analysis and systemic advocacy in New York and nationally. As many of you know, that's where the laws and the regulations are uh, promulgated, uh, is on a state level and on a national level. Anything that we talk about in this program or in any other program always refers to the federal law and the federal standards unless I specify otherwise. So we're talking about really the standards that are uh, available for everyone in the United States nursing homes in these programs. We also do some education and outreach uh, such as this program to consumers and families and ombudsmen, advocates, and other stakeholders. We are a membership organization uh, based in New York again, so we have a number of Amazon programs here, uh, ARP New York, Alzheimer's Associations, chapters, excuse me, uh, Caring Kind, a uh, number of adult uh, disabled organizations as well. And I've been with LTCCC since November of 2002, so uh, next month will be my the 15th anniversary, and then I've been executive director since 2005. So as I mentioned, we're going to do a brief background, uh, just as we always do, starting out with what the nursing home system is and how it works. I'm going to try to keep that very brief because I want to make sure that we spend time today talking about the focus of the program, which is um, antipsychotic drugging, psychotropic drugs in general, pharmacy services, and dementia care. Now. Generally speaking, pharmacy services, uh, I know it probably doesn't sound that interesting or that important. What happened in the new regulations and why I included it here is that in looking at dementia care and trying to address the issue of uh, the persistence of high levels of antipsychotic drugging in, nurse, in U.S. nursing homes in our state and across the country, the um, CMS, when they issued the new regulations, they did a lot of focus on pharmacy services and ensuring that there was a professional review of what is being given to a resident and why. So that's why we're including pharmacy services here and why it's so important. The program doesn't necessarily focus on dementia care, but dementia is, uh, is an important issue for nursing home residents. The majority of nursing home residents have some form of memory loss. Um, or dementia, and the antipsychotic drugging and the psychotropic drugging um, often affects and is targeted to residents with dementia, which is why we focus on it a bit in this program. So the nursing home system, in a nutshell, everything that we talk about in terms of the nursing home law and nursing home regulations on a federal level and to a large extent on a state level, it comes from the nursing home reform law. Uh, almost every nursing home in our state, New York, across the country, participates in Medicaid and or Medicare. And by participate, I mean that they take Medicaid and or Medicare money. Usually it's both for some or, or of the services they provide. 
In order to do that, in order to participate in Medicaid or Medicare, a facility agrees to meet every single standard provided for in federal law. Now, a state can have additional protections, but no state can have less protections. And that's, again, why uh, we focus so much on the federal requirements. Just as a quick example, with the state protections, many states have a minimum requirements for staffing, for certain levels of staffing, uh, per resident per day. Uh, some states, actually two-thirds of the states have that now approximately. Uh, our state, New York, does not, but that's something in addition that, that a state can do uh, that many states do do, but um, some still do not. Now, the nursing home reform law, just a little bit of a background, it's really a, a very special and valuable law, and that's why I always come back to it. It requires that every nursing home provide a level of service and a level of care that's sufficient for each resident to attain and maintain his or her highest practicable physical, emotional, and social well-being. Highest practicable, I know, is, is kind of a mouthful and can be a difficult concept to get around. So I always like to give a couple of examples. So when we talk about highest practical, I think about my Aunt Hilda, um, and she was in a nursing home. Uh, she passed away a couple of years ago, but she lived to be over 100. And I remember visiting her, and she used to go in her late 90s for what they called occupational therapy. And my aunt and my mother used to, you know, they thought that was very funny that, that you know, that Hilda at age 96 was getting occupational therapy because what kind of occupation was she expecting to have at that time? Um, but that's not the point. The point was, and, and, and Hilda's occupational therapy was that they were helping her to walk up and down the hall um, several times a week. You know, they would walk around the nursing home. Sometimes they would take her out a little bit, not usually very far. But the point was is that she was getting the therapy services that she needed in order to maintain her ability to walk, to be mobile, and so that she did not become bedridden, she did not become uh, wholly um, dependent upon a wheelchair. So highest practicable uh, in this sense, you know, as we talk about it, means that Hilda was able to maintain her ability to walk with help. And that's what we talk about when providing those services that, that you know, people get uh, older, people who are in nursing homes tend to be very frail, and there are some things that are inevitable. But if it's not inevitable, it shouldn't happen. And that's why the nursing home reform law is, to my mind, so special, because it really goes to what the individual resident's need, needs are. And the expectation is that for every single nursing home resident, these services are going to be provided based upon what he or she needs. And it's not just physical, it's not just clinical, it also goes to emotional and to social well-being, that someone just shouldn't be left there alone in a room. Uh, bingo, as I often will say, it shouldn't be the only activity available to residents, that it's the facility's obligation to provide these services. And as I know here, that's what we pay for. Um, this is not a, a room and board situation. This is not a YMCA where people are getting a bed and a towel and access to a shower overnight. This is paying a lot of money and with an, a promise to a very vulnerable and valuable um, population that care is going to be provided for them in a way that is professional and that meets their needs. Importantly, this is what every provider needs to provide when they contract with Medicaid and or Medicare. And certainly, as I noted at the end here, that's what every resident deserves. Uh, I just wanted to mention, I noted here in the, if you're looking at the slide in the red box with the arrow on the right-hand side, this includes residents with dementia. Uh, as I mentioned before, and as I'll mention again, most residents in nursing homes have some degree of memory loss uh, or dementia, so it is incumbent upon the facility to be meeting those residents' needs. Uh, there's nothing that, there's very few things I should say that make me angrier than when I hear a facility saying, oh, we, you know, she has dementia, we didn't know what to do. Uh, that is 
their job, and that's what we have a right to expect. And there is a lot out there for facilities to be professional and to meet those standards for people with dementia. So why are the, the laws and the regulations important here? Well, from 1987 on, the Nursing Home Reform Law, which was passed in 1987, prescribes the use of antipsychotic drugs and other psychotic drugs as a form of chemical restraint. In other words, being used to control a resident or to sedate a resident for the convenience of staff. So what happened at 1987, in May of 2001, the Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services, the federal, federal government, did a study, and his study found that, well, actually what he said, excuse me, as I quote him here, is that he said that nursing home residents and their families should be, and these are his words, outraged by the results of his office's report that found that well over a quarter of a million nursing home residents in the United States were receiving antipsychotic drugs for medically unaccepted off-label uses. And the next year, in 2012, he did another analysis of resident records, and his office found that 91% of those records did not contain any evidence that the resident or the resident's family or their representative participated in the care planning process for that resident. Every single one of the residents in those studies have been given an antipsychotic drug. And then, importantly, what we're going to talk about today as well is that recent updates to the federal regulations have strengthened a lot of the government expectations for both good dementia care and avoiding inappropriate psychotropic, including antipsychotic drugging. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, this is not a dementia care uh, focused program in the sense or requirements, because this really goes to everyone in terms of getting uh, antipsychotic drugs or other psychotropic drugs inappropriately. But I thought it was important to speak a little bit about dementia because, again, that is most residents in nursing homes, and this is something that is often used on those residents in nursing homes. Now, some of the common behavioral symptoms, as they're sometimes called with dementia, as I note here in red, restlessness, uh, people who are wandering, people who become agitated or become aggressive in, and express those behaviors. My um, parents had a friend who had early onset dementia, and he used to make a chirping noise. He would just, that's how, uh, you know, sometimes when he was agitated or sometimes he would just, just make for hours, he would make a chirping noise. And he actually got kicked out of a nursing home because they said they did not know what to do with him. Uh, as I mentioned before, the standards really go to ensuring that dementia care is good. So that was a very disappointing thing for me to hear. But these are some of the symptoms that we talk about when we talk about you know, the behavioral symptoms with dementia and the reasons why people are often given a antipsychotic drug or other psychopharmacological drug as a sedative to quiet them down, to stop them from exhibiting those behaviors. However, as you'll note underneath here, um, too often residents with these symptoms are given these drugs instead of the care that they need to, to respond to what they are trying to express. And what I often say to people, and I try to remember and I urge people to remember, is that when someone has one of these behavioral symptoms, so to speak, they are expressing something. There is something that they are trying to say that they are not able to say. They could be in pain, they could be constipated, they could be scared, they could be bored, they could be hungry, they could have uh, an infection or a fever. There, there's a number of things. It's the responsibility, it's the standard of care for the nursing home and the caregivers to be addressing what is going on, the underlying symptoms that the resident is trying to express. Because think about it, a resident with, with dementia, especially someone who has fairly significant um, dementia, is not able to say, um, oh, I'm, I'm in pain. I have a headache, and the headache hasn't gone away, or I have a toothache, and the toothache ha hasn't gone away. I need some aspirin, or I need to see a doctor. So what do they do? They can't say those things, so they may scratch, or they may cry, or they may scream. Uh, so when you give someone a sedative, you know, especially a powerful sedative like an antipsychotic drug, that stops them from expressing themselves. It stops them from having those 
behavioral symptoms, but it does not address the underlying cause of what is going on. Lastly, I just wanted to mention before we move on that although we're talking, you know, uh, quite often about residents with dementia, inappropriate drugging can happen to anyone, and we have seen that happen. And I've done some work with family councils over the past couple of years here in New York City, and, you know, I talk to people from around the country, and I know that, you know, it could affect people who have other conditions as well, who may or may not be able to express themselves. Uh, so just a little bit of background of what we're trying to, what exactly is the problem we're talking about today. Now, one in five, that's 20% of U.S. nursing home residents, I just looked this up a couple of days ago, they are being, being given, excuse me, powerful antipsychotic drugs. Only about 2%, it's actually about 1.5% of the population is ever going to be diagnosed with a psychotic condition that CMS recognizes when it what we call risk adjusts for using these drugs. So I don't want to get too much into the background of that, but essentially CMS um, does a risk adjustment. It allows facilities to provide these drugs um, pretty much with impunity to someone who has a diagnosis of schizophrenia, Tourette syndrome, or Huntington's disease. Um, so those are the conditions for which CMS says, okay, we're not going to count those in your rate of antipsychotic drugging. I'm not a clinician, I'm not a doctor, but I am able to read and I looked up some research and I found that uh, roughly speaking, as I mentioned, about 1.5% of the population will ever have one of those conditions. Uh, it's extremely, extremely rare for someone to have, first have those symptoms, first have a diagnosis when they're in their 80s or 90s. Generally speaking, if people have one of those conditions, it, it, it uh, manifests when they're in their, generally by the time when they're in their 20s or 30s, and as I said, almost never when they're 80s or 90s. So these are just things that I want to plug in to you all, is that we still have one out of five nursing home residents are being, being given these drugs, and a very, very, very small percentage of the population will ever be diagnosed with a condition that CMS itself, that the centers for Medicare and Medicaid services, the federal government recognizes as being potentially appropriate. Uh, so how do we get at that? What do we do about this maybe 18% of the, of the nursing home population that are possibly getting these drugs inappropriately? Well, what happened was is that over the years, it became a common practice to sedate residents who had dementia who were, who were exhibiting some of those behavioral symptoms to give them an antipsychotic drug. However, the Food and Drug Administration in 2005 issued a black box warning which states elderly, patient, excuse me, elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis treated with atypical antipsychotic drugs are at an increased risk of death. In addition, and this is really important, antipsychotics commonly have very serious side effects. They increase the risks of falls. They increase um, the uh, risk of Parkinsonism, developing Parkinson's-like symptoms. Um, they increase strokes and heart attacks. Importantly, they also stupefy residents. And I, I, sometimes I run into people and say, well, they have dementia. If they're stupefied, um, you know, does it matter that much? Well, it does. And one reason why it does is because, as I note here, the drugs can seriously exacerbate some of those functional and cognitive limitations that someone with dementia is experiencing. Most importantly, that's why I put it in radio. I don't know if it's most importantly, but I thought it was very important to note that antipsychotic drugs, clinically speaking, are not effective for more than a short period of time in addressing the so-called behavioral symptoms of dementia. So very quickly, and we have a lot of materials on our website. We have a dementia care toolkit, which gets at a lot of these things. And this is something that is very close to my heart. So I'm always happy if you have a question or something, please uh, shoot me an email because it's such an astounding problem that so many people are, are not that aware of. But what happens is someone with dementia, usually uh, they might become agitated, they become upset. And so the first thing that the caregivers want to do, and what, certainly what the family members want, is for that resident to be calm. They don't want to see, no one wants to see 
a resident agitated or upset, dangerous to him or herself or to others in the facility. So there are times when, you know, when under those under pretty extreme circumstances, if someone is a danger to him or herself or to others, that an antipsychotic drug or, or a powerful, you know, drug sedative may be appropriate uh, in the short term. But as I note here, they're not effective for long-term use. So what should happen, and we, again, we have materials that talk about this, what should happen and what the law requires is two things. One is that, the, one, is that immediately the facility look at non-pharmacological approaches. So as I mentioned earlier on, when we talk about those behavioral symptoms, the resident is trying, the individual is trying to express something discomfort, boredom, uh, upset, fear. It's up to the facility to take the time and to be assessing what is going on and find a non-pharmacal, non-drugging approach to addressing those underlying symptoms. Could be that they have an infection. Could be that, as I mentioned before, they have a toothache or they're constipated. Whatever, that is up to the facility to be exploring and looking at and trying to and working on ensuring I should say meeting those residents needs and at the same time we want to see activities being taken to reduce those drugs so if you start someone on a Haldol for instance which is a antipsychotic drug uh, because they're extremely ab- agitated they're they're inconsolable they're scratching or whatever then immediately as you're doing the, the non-pharmacological approaches they should also be looking at the gradual dose reduction, reducing those drugs. What we see too often is the opposite, and that's why I thought it was so important to mention this at the bottom, is that the drugs are not effective for more than a short period of time. So what happens is someone say, given, is given the Haldol, and the Haldol eventually becomes ineffective. And so the person, because their symptoms were never, the reason for their symptoms were never addressed, they start having those behaviors again. So what often happens is that a facility will then give them a second drug, Seroquel or or, or something else, another psychotropic drug, and that just adds to it. It compounds all these serious side effects. It compounds the risk of death, compounds the risk of those side effects. It compounds, excuse me, the functional and cognitive decline of that individual because the drugs don't work for a long period of time. So Facilities will too often say, oh, we need to give her something else because she's getting worse, but actually it's because the medication is just not being helpful and looks it's not meant to do that. It's not meant for a long-term um, approach to addressing symptoms of dementia. So I also want to mention that we're, we're focused here on the nursing home um, rules and requirements However, this is a problem across the board. This is a problem for people, especially for people with, with dementia, but even for older people without dementia who are, can be very susceptible to drugs, and oftentimes they and their families, people who are working with them, don't have the clinical background or the understanding of how dangerous some of these drugs are. So I, I wanted to mention, in particular, with assisted living, there was a, a study that came out uh, a few months ago that found that three-quarters of assisted living residents have a documented diagnosis of dementia. And over a third of those people were being given antipsychotic drugs. So it's even higher than what's going on in nursing homes. And that study found that residents in an assisted living that had a, quote-unquote, memory care unit were more likely to be treated with both dementia medications and antipsychotic drugs. So uh, we don't have time to get into it now, but... There's not a lot of standards in terms of, of assisted living, adult homes, um, boarding care, you know, other settings where the elderly live that are not licensed nursing homes. Those regulations and those standards, there are virtually no federal standards, and they're all really based upon the states, and the state standards tend to be much, much lower. So this is something that I wanted to plug in with you all that have, uh, you know, resident or work with residents in different settings that it's really important. However, I feel that you know when we talk about standards of care, which is what we talk about in the nursing home setting, that those standards that you know they may not be legal requirements 
uh, in the same way that they are for nursing homes and what we talk about today, but they are good standards and good practices and expectations, minimally expectations, that we should have for our residents who are being cared for in other settings, including being cared for at home. So I actually had, I'll, um, brief aside, I had a uh, friend whose mother was in a independent living. It was an apartment where, you know, they got some cleaning services, I think, and, and a meal once a day. And she had, I think she broke her wrist and she went and she went for surgery and they put her on an antipsychotic drug and both the surgeon and her doctor said to my friends don't look it up online <laughs> which is just so incredibly outrageous so you know rather than saying you know be a informed consumer rather than understand what is going on with your mother and how we're treating her they said they said do the opposite uh, which I think is just pretty terrible. So that's why we really want to plug in to the greatest extent possible with people across all settings, because, settings excuse me, because this is an issue that affects people wherever they get care. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, the, the more general standards in terms of the residents' rights and how they relate to uh, antipsychotic drugging and dementia care. And then I'm going to talk about some of the specifics and some examples for, um, for us to keep in mind. So, as I mentioned before, the nursing home reform law was passed in 1987. The regulations came out, the federal regulations came out in 1991. Uh, the reason why we're doing these programs, by the way, is because the regulations were revised last year, and those revisions are being implemented over the next three years. But the standards that we talk about, many of them have existed for a long time, including all three standards that are on this page, informed decision-making, which means that residents have the right to be informed about the risks and benefits of any medication or any treatment, any proposed treatment, residents have the right to be informed about. It. Residents have the right to refuse a medication or any other treatment. And then residents have the right to be free from chemical restraints. So again, it is against the law to give medications to someone who, that are not meant to benefit a clinical condition. Um, and the example I give here is, is such as for the convenience of staff. Uh, so these are some of the general things. Again, they've been in place since 1991, and they all speak to ensuring that residents are not being given drugs that are not appropriate for them and that could be dangerous to them, uh, including psychotropics and especially uh, antipsychotic drugs. I just want to mention a little bit about informed uh, consent, informed decision making, and the right to, to refuse. These are also issues about which we have been uh, very concerned. A lot of the times, as I mentioned earlier on, the U.S. Inspector General found that 91 percent of the resident records indicated that a family, neither the family nor the resident, were brought in in terms of decision making about care, this is an issue that we see a lot of and about which we're very concerned, is that people have the right, residents have the right, and if the resident doesn't have capacity, the family or the person who is uh, making, who is the um, designated decision maker has the right to be informed about the risks and benefits of any medication or any treatment. And they have the right to refuse. They have the right to refuse even if refusing is a bad idea. And as I you know, unfortunately often do is I, I, often make mis I often make choices, excuse me, that are not the best choices for me. I'll have a second piece of cake, uh, even though my doctor says that I should reduce my intake of sugar. That's my right. I'm a grown up and I can do what I want to do. And the same is true for nursing home residents, that they have the right to make decisions and they have the right to make decisions even if those decisions are against what the doctor or what the staff think they should be doing. And if it comes to someone with dementia and, this, and the decisions, excuse me, are being made by a family member or someone else, as long as those decisions are in line with what the person would want to have, um, then that is okay. You know, sometimes if someone is not eating, we'll see. Uh, a little bit, you know, a different, different subject, but 
um, someone's not eating and the food isn't very tasty and they're on a low salt diet, you know what, if you're, and I don't want to give clinical advice to anyone nor legal advice to anybody, but if you're, you know, 96 years old and you're not eating because the food's not tasty and having something that tastes good or maybe having a little salt, that may be a decision that you would want to make uh, as an individual or that your loved one may want to make for you thinking about what's in your best interest in terms of your quality of life, et cetera. Uh, so again, I, I don't, I'm not and I can't give clinical advice, um, but I just wanted to mention that we have the right and we don't lose the right to make um, decisions whether or not the doctors or the medical professionals think that they're in our best interest. Uh, so a little bit about informed consent because I thought that it was important. So as I put in the flag here on the right-hand side, informed consent is an ethical concept, and that means that essentially every patient should understand and agree to the potential consequences of his or her care. Uh, what I have here on the left-hand side is pretty much directly from the federal regulations, uh, and we always have that on our website in our fact sheets, et cetera, so you can look at the fact sheet on informed consent. But a few important points, resident has the right to participate in planning their care and planning their treatment. Remember what I said at the very start again, what the U.S. Inspector General found was that that was not happening. So that's really important, not just in terms of dementia care in terms of, or in terms of antipsychotic drugging, across the board. Uh, we have some good materials. They're all free. Uh, and you're, you're happy, you will, you know, excuse me, we're very happy for anyone who wants to adapt them for their own use or for their own organization, but we have materials that list out some of the things that go into care planning, some of the things that go into a resident assessment that you can use, but it's really important for people to understand that they have a right to participate uh, in both the planning of care and the planning of treatment and in the assessment process. People have the right to be fully informed in language that he or she can understand of his or her total health status. And again, this goes to if you're a resident with dementia, it goes to the family member, it goes to whoever has decision-making capacity. Uh, the resident has the right to be informed in advance of the care to be furnished, who is going to provide it, to be informed of any proposed changes in the care or treatment, um, and to be informed in terms of the risks and the benefits of the care and alternatives, no matter whether those alternatives are more expensive or not. So that's really important. That's also, I didn't put it here, but it's from the federal regulation. And as I mentioned before, everyone has the right to refuse treatment. You, just because you go into a nursing home doesn't mean you, ha you don't have the right to make decisions whether or not someone else thinks they're the best decisions for you. So I included a little checklist here, and as I mentioned before, and you can see again here, we have a fact sheet that's just on informed consent. It's on our website, nursinghome411.org. All those materials are free, and we're happy for you to download them and use them in any way that you think is appropriate. So moving on, I want to talk about unnecessary drugs in general, because this is really the basis for prohibiting uh, antipsychotic drugs, inappropriate psychotropic drug, drugging, et cetera. So, this is all, as you can see, because of the italics, uh, from the federal regulations. Each resident's drug regimen must be free from unnecessary drugs. What is an unnecessary drug? It's any drug when used in excessive dosage for too long without adequate monitoring, without adequate indications for its use, and by that we're talking about clinical indications for its use, or in the presence of adverse consequences which indicate the dose should be reduced or discontinued. What's an adverse consequence? Well, one of them, you know, a couple of them I mentioned before when we talked about potential side effects, but they could be um, falling, it could be um, risks related to you know, Parkinsonism or developing Parkinson's-like um, symptoms. It could be that they're becoming stupefied, that they're becoming more and more uh, you know, very quickly, I should say, uh, that their dementia or their level of dementia is increasing. So those are some of the things to look out for. A lot of times, just to, to step back for a second, especially for family members and for ombudsmen and advocates who are going into a nursing home or working directly with residents and families, is that 
the residents and the families are not consulted too often uh, when there is a problem with the use of antipsychotic drugs. And that, again, gets to what the Inspector General said. So it's important for families, for residents, for advocates, uh, for ombudsmen to be looking at these things. What is going on? Are you seeing your residents who are all of a sudden they're, they're getting dramatically worse? Why is that happening? Uh, if you have a resident who one day is talking and then, and then all of a sudden they're not, they're not really responsive, they're not recognizing people, they become listless, they're not eating, it doesn't mean automatically that something bad is happening, but it is something that you want, may want to explore. And I know that, you know, we, we know of you know, a number of family members who have learned about this problem and then gone back and found out that their resident was put on these drugs. Uh, so it's always important to ask questions. We do have a list on our website, not to, not to plug our website too much, but we have a list on our website of antipsychotic drugs, and of course you can get that online as well. But you can easily see and find out and compare what drugs your resident is on against that list. So I want to talk a bit about some of the additional requirements for psychotropic drugs, and I highlighted here the facility must assure after conducting a comprehensive assessment of a resident. Uh, so we have the assessment and then we have the care planning for the resident and in providing that care, the facility must ensure that residents who have not used psychotropic drugs are not given those drugs unless the medication is necessary to treat a specific condition that's been diagnosed and documented in the clinical record. I included this because I think it's so important that one, we're talking about specific condition, not a general condition, not a feeling, not a things were happening, a specific condition that's been diagnosed and documented and that is in the resident's record. Because we want to see that record keeping. We want to see that there's substantiation for why these, why these drugs are being given. Next, residents who use psychotropic drugs should receive, as I mentioned before, gradual dose reductions and behavioral interventions unless it's clinically contraindicated for that resident. Um, so again, two things, gradual dose reduction and behavioral interventions. So the behavioral interventions means that instead of giving them the drug, as I mentioned in the example before, someone became agitated, set, is checking to see maybe she has a, um, maybe she's in pain, maybe he's constipated, maybe He's bored. There could be many different things why this is happening. It's up to the facility to be exploring on an ongoing basis other ways of helping that resident. And then at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, undertaking gradual dose reduction because you just don't want to keep people on these drugs forever. They stop working. We need to be doing, the expectation is, that something else is going on with the resident, and therefore something else should be going on with the facility. Not just plugging in a drug and letting it go, but looking to see, well, what is going on with this resident? Maybe the resident becomes agitated every afternoon at the same time. Maybe the resident uh, becomes upset when he or she is being given a bath or taken to a bath. What else can we be doing? Can we be giving her a shower instead of a bath? Can we be giving her a bath in the evening rather than in the morning. Maybe she's an evening person. Maybe, you know, if there's family there, we can talk to the family. If there's no family there, let's try it out. Let's see what else is going to work to help this resident, not just give them a drug and say that's the treatment for whatever the situation is. The last two relate to PRN orders. Now, what PRN means essentially is that a doctor, a doctor has to, you know, or, or someone who has prescribing ability has to prescribe the drugs, but PRN means essentially that it could be given by the people on the floor as needed, you know, the nurses uh, who are on the floor treating the residents. So in the new regulations, CMS, the federal government, put in some very important restrictions around PRN use. Uh, so residents do not receive psychotropic drugs pursuant to a PRN order unless that medication is necessary, again, to treat a diagnosed specific condition documented in the clinical record. And even with that, the PRN orders are limited to 14 days. Now, in the handout that's online now, 
include some of those limited exceptions. So you have that information and you have a link to more resources. I just didn't want to get into it here. And by the way, that picture on the right-hand side, the person in the wheelchair, that's my aunt helper, who lived to be over 100, and that's my mother. <laughs> uh, so I want to, as I mentioned before, we don't usually get into things like pharmacy services necessarily. It doesn't feel too often like it's the most important thing when you're talking about residents and their well-being and, and their happiness. But there's a lot that went into addressing this issue in the new regulations that was put into pharmacy services. So here they are. The drug regimen of each resident must be reviewed at least one time a month by a licensed pharmacist. So this essentially is really important because, as I said, CMS added this here for the new regulations, and it added a role for the pharmacist in the nursing home or the pharmacist that is servicing the nursing home that they have to be a separate set of professional eyes that's looking at the drugging going on, you know, drug regimen of the, res of the resident at least once a month. The review must include a review by the pharmacist of the resident's medical chart. So what CMS is trying to do here is we want you, we want the pharmacist in addition to the nursing home care staff to be thinking about what is going on with the resident what is the situation with the resident, and what is the situation under which these drugs are being given? Because we know that they're dangerous. We know that they are not um, not, excuse me, not effective for a very long period of time. So when we are talking specifically about psychotropic drugs, we want to see, you know, what is going on here. We want to make sure that professionals are looking at it and that they're accountable for looking at it. So the pharmacist, that's where we get to the third bullet here, the pharmacist must report, must report any irregularities to the attending physician and the facility's medical director and director of nursing, and these reports must be acted upon. And a lot of must, every time you see a must, uh, for those of you who are, who, are, who are lawyers, you know, must means you don't really have discretion. You have to do that. So drug, drug, excuse me, drug irregularities. Irregularities include but are not limited to any drug that meets the criteria for an unnecessary drug. We talked about that before, what an unnecessary drug is, and that's also in the handout. So this, this you, don't, you don't have to memorize this stuff. This um, PowerPoint is now up on the website. Feel free to use it, cut it, paste it. I don't care. Uh, if it's useful, I'm really happy for you to have it. And the same thing, we have these materials in the, uh, in, in the two-page handout as well that is up on the website, and we will have it in the, the recording of this presentation by the end of the week. So you don't have to memorize all this, but here it is. You know, so irreg irregularities include any drug that meets the criteria for an unnecessary drug. Any irregularity noted by the pharmacist must be documented on a separate written report. The written report must be sent to the attending physician, the facility's medical director, and the director of nursing. The report must list, at a minimum, the resident's name, the relevant drug, and the irregularity the pharmacist has identified. And then the attending physician must document in the resident's medical record that the identified irregularity has been reviewed and what, if any, action has been taken to address it. And if there's not going to be any change in the medication given to the resident, the attending physician should document his or her rationale for not making that change in the resident's medical record. Why is this so important? Why did I get into so much detail here? Is because, as I mentioned from the very start of our program today, too often the residents, the families, decision makers for the resident were not involved in making a decision about the drugs being given for the resident, and they were not involved in the care planning. So all, all these things really hammer home, I think, how we have to have documentation. We have to, they have to have, excuse me. They have to be saying, what are we doing? We re review this. This is something that I see. Why is it going on, et cetera? And it's not just being filed away. It's going to the physician. It's going to the medical director, it's going to the 
excuse me, director of nursing, it is going every place. Everyone has now a responsibility and an expectation that they know what's going on with that resident. They know the background of what's going on with the resident. They know why the resident is, is getting these medications, etc. And this, if it's implemented, if we see this in action, if it, you know, if it is done the way it's supposed to be done, this should dramatically change, I think, the way that these drugs are given. So I'm going to do a quick review of what we talked about today. As I mentioned, you know, every program we do a handout. And because I know that the, the, that the programs tend to be content heavy, meaning, you know, there's a lot of information that comes out and it can be a bit overwhelming, especially if you're not used to, um, you know, dealing with it that frequently. And most families, most ombudsmen, um, most advocates are not. So I wanted to, I'll just talk about it briefly, and again, this is already on our website. So again, the drug regimen review. The drug regimen, meaning what the drugs are being given to the resident, to each resident, must be reviewed at least once a month by a licensed pharmacist. It must include a review of the resident's medical chart. Why is that important? Again, this is not just a dry, oh, you know, so-and-so from X nursing home is getting Seroquel and uh, Coumadin, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine, I'm signing off on it. They have to. The expectation is that that pharmacist is taking a real look at what's going on with the individual and how the drugs are, have a role and what is going on in terms of helping them addressing clinical symptoms or not addressing their clinical symptoms. The pharmacist must report any irregularities to the attending physician, the facility medical director, the director of nursing, and these reports must be acted upon doesn't mean that they necessarily have to do X, Y, or Z. It means they have to be responsive to any issues that are raised by the, by the pharmacist. And if they're not making a change, for instance, if it is a antipsychotic drug that the pharmacist doesn't think is appropriate, they have to say, well, why, why are we keeping it? Why are we keeping the resident on this? And again, this happens a month from now. It's not buried till the next quarter or the next you know, half year, et cetera. It happens every single month. And then I included a couple of things here, free from unnecessary drugs. Uh, we talk about uh, psychotropic drugs on page two in particular. And then I included in the pink you know, um, square some basic dementia care requirements and expectations. So this is what we expect to happen in a facility, in a nursing home, but again, I hope that this is useful to people who are in other settings, such as assisted living or in getting care at home, et cetera, is that if you have questions about um, what drugs you're getting or what drug your, your loved one or your, your individual who you're working with is getting, then this list should be, I hope, useful. You know, so here, here we go. Obtain details about the person's behavior. When, you know, if the person is having those so-called behavioral related, you know, behavioral symptoms of dementia, when are they happening? How severe are they? What are their duration? Exclude potentially remediable, excuse me, causes of behavior, such as a medical condition, something that's medication related. Could be that someone is having a bad reaction to a medication. Could be a physical um, reason, such as they're uncomfortable. Uh, as I said, you know, before someone might be constipated or have a toothache. Um, is it emotional? Is it environmental? We've had issues that uh, I know a nursing home down by us who the person was put in every afternoon. He was in a wheelchair. He had dementia and he was he was put into the TV room and the light was shining in where they from the window every afternoon right in his face from where he was seated every single day. He could not say the light shining in my face. It's hurting me. Move me someplace else. So he, you know, he expressed himself the only way that he could. Um, so that's the kind of thing is exclude potentially remedial, remediable, excuse me, causes of behaviors. Implement non-pharmacological approaches to care. And then implement the care plan consistently. That includes, this is number four, and communicate it across shifts and among caregivers and with the resident or family representative to the extent possible. So that's really important. It's not just happening Monday through Friday on the day shift because uh, people's needs, people's fears, people's comfort exist 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
and then assess the effects of the approaches, identify benefits, identify problems, etc., and adjust treatment accordingly. So this has to be an ongoing process because residents, including residents with dementia, are living things. We change. Different things change for us each and every day. We don't become new people each day, obviously, but things change. Situations may change. Things that make us happy or comfortable may change. And that happens to people with dementia as well. Uh, so a little bit about the programs, and we're just about done here, uh, and I'm going to open it up for Q&A. But I want to let you know we're doing these programs now through at least January. We have um, funding from the New York State Health Foundation, which is uh, supporting these programs. All the resources, again, are on nursinghome411.org. And um, we are also on Facebook and on Twitter and on the web. Now, for ombudsmen in New York State, if you'd like us to let your supervisor know that you attended this training program, we have a quick survey at uh, www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash ltccc dash ltcop1. And then for family members in New York State, there's um, I highly recommend connecting with the Alliance of New York Family Councils. Again, all this material is on our website, too, so if you missed anything, you can go back, including those web addresses. So I'm going to open it up for questions and comments. I take that back. I'm sorry. There's a lot of feedback. So if you have a question, press star six. But I, I saw we got a couple of questions in the queue. So I am going to uh, I'm going to answer them first. Uh, so one question was: Do the private pay only homes access funding from CMS? Um, well, if it's private pay only, then it then it's not um, it's certainly not CMS. So these are nursing homes. We're, we're only talking about nursing homes that are, as I said, participating in Medicare or and or Medicaid for their for their residents or for you know people that they're caring for. So if they take you know, any, you know, $10 or more, so to speak, from CMS, you know, from Medicare or Medicaid, then they are participating. If they don't, then they're not. And if they're in assisted living or an adult home or, you know, an elder care housing, then they also, uh, these laws do not apply to them. Okay, so I'm going to open it up. If anyone has any questions or comments, I'd be happy to respond to them. And just press star six on your phone. Hi. I see someone opened up, but I can't. I can't hear any question if you have it. Richard, uh, it's Martin Petrov here. Can you Martin. hear me? Yes. You know, I I can't imagine. A lay person um, uh, as an ombudsman. Uh, I can't imagine an ombudsman going into a nursing home with these rules under his arm and and being effective. I mean, this is really heavy duty stuff. And you're you're coming in and telling the nursing home or asking the nursing home. When does this come in in real life? What can you do with all these rules? Uh, well, thanks, Martin. That, that's a really good question. So I think that, and that that's why I kept on coming back to these materials being available on the website. And for every single uh, regulation that we talk about, we have a two-page fact sheet. So if you're seeing an issue uh, as an ombudsman or as an advocate that goes into nursing homes or is working with a family or with a resident, and, and you say, hmm, the person has dementia and they seem all of a sudden to have really gone downhill very rapidly. They're very sluggish. Um, something seems to have happened. What they can do is they can go to our website and you know, we have a learning center and they could you know, download one of these sheets. So it could be something on antipsychotic drugs, and they could find that right there. So that, And that's true for any standard. So if you feel like there's been resident abuse or neglect, the same thing. We have a fact sheet on abuse and neglect to give you some basic information 
about what your rights are. So again, you know, to get to Martin's question, I know that um, you know we've had ombudsmen. Uh, you know, we we train ombudsmen, I should say, and I know others have gone in to do um, resident and family council programs. This is something that ombudsmen can do, and to let them know about the problem with, for instance, antipsychotic drugging. That it's a very widespread problem that many families don't know about it. So to be aware, be aware of if your resident uh, with dementia is experiencing some of these um, some of these conditions. Uh, hello, Charles. Charles. hello, Richard. Yes, hi, Charles. Wants to, Charles Gorgi is on. He's going to respond to you as well. Thanks, Charles. Hi, thank you. I wanted to respond to uh, what Martin raised, um, which is certainly a good point. But um, speaking as an ombudsman, for me, that part of it is the least of the uh, of, of the burden. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, having those regulations and 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 bringing them up when needed for, for me is is, is really not a difficulty at all. Where, where I have the difficulty, and I see that the real kind of sticking point with this issue as an ombudsman is identifying the residents who are being treated inappropriately with these medications. Because we're kind of like in a catch-22 as an ombudsman. We can't really go into medical records unless we have a resident's permission. But a resident who is on these drugs is not likely to have the capacity to give us permission. But I just can't be going and just taking every medical chart off the shelf and looking at the medication lists. Uh, I have to have some kind of authorization. So for me, that is the most frustrating part of this, is just being able to identify these residents. I have to wait for a family member to come to me with the question about what's going on, or maybe uh, on a rare occasion I can observe something that might give me a justification to raise an issue. But uh, but that that is the hard part. Just just skirting around the you know all, all the, the, the 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 privacy rules and restrictions and all of that just to identify who these patients are. Uh, and this is Richard. I, I would say also, and why I focus so much on the pharmacy services part of the new regulations is that it puts a, I think, a, a, a more, a clearer, I should say, responsibility on individuals within the facility. And that, that's why I kept on emphasizing that these things have to go, and there has to be this monthly review, it has to go into the resident's record, it has to go to the uh, director of, the medical director and the director of nursing, et cetera, because that gives, if, if a family is talking to an attorney, for instance, uh, or if they're being helped in, you know, in a legal capacity, that, that gives a paper trail that did not exist before. So it's an additional safeguard, and it's something, you know, of course, that a, um, an ombudsman or, or any advocate, um, you know, including a, an individual advocate, you know, a family member working with a resident or a resident him or herself could say, well, I want to see my record. I want to see, you know, where, where, how was this addressed? A big issue that we see is you know, things that existed for a long time did, um, you know, in terms of was there a good input of the family, of the resident, and those around him or her in the assessment and care planning processes. So, you know, what we try to do is really bolster, you know, what has existed and also tell people about what is new and, and what can be used as tools. But I think, I think you're right, Martin. I mean, it's challenging. It's, you know, the organization wouldn't exist if these things were um, were easier to implement. Thank you, Martin. Um, <laughs> You're more than welcome. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna we're gonna finish up now. Unless there's any other questions, because I know that uh, in New York we have a program at two o'clock for the ombudsman, so I don't want anyone to be late for that. Again, thank you all very much for joining us. All the materials are on nursinghome411.org. Uh, we don't get paid for you to take them. They're just, if they're useful, then please feel free to use them and take them and adapt them for yourself or your own organization. Uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Thank you.